Chapter 6 The same delightful prospect at the end of the high street, over the marsh, which had witnessed not so long ago the final encounter in the Wars of the Roses and the subsequent armistice, was, of course, found to be peculiarly attractive that morning to those who knew, and who did not, that the combatants had left by the 1120 steam tram to fight among the sand dunes, and that the intrepid padre had rushed after them in a taxi. The padre's taxi had returned empty, and the driver seemed to know nothing whatever about anything, so the only thing for everybody to do was to put off lunch and wait for the arrival of the next tram, which occurred at 1.37. In consequence, all the doors in Tilling flew open like those of cuckoo clocks at ten minutes before that hour, and this pleasant promenade was full of those who so keenly admired autumn tints. From here, the progress of the tram across the plain was in full view. So, too, was the shed-like station across the river, which was the terminus of the line, and expectation when the two-wagon little train approached the end of its journey, was so tense that it was almost disagreeable. A couple of hours had elapsed since, like the fishers who sailed away into the west and were seen no more till the corpses lay out on the shining sand, the three had left for the sand dunes, and a couple of hours, so reasoned the cosmic consciousness of Tilling, gave ample time for a duel to be fought, if the padre was not in time to stop it, and for him to stop it if he was. No surgical assistance, as far as was known, had been summoned, but the reason for that might easily be that a surgeon's skill was no longer, alas, of any avail for one, if not both, of the combatants. But if such was the case, it was nice to hope that the padre had been in time to supply spiritual aid to anyone whom first aid and probes were powerless to succour. The variety of denouement which the approaching tram that had now cut off steam was capable of providing was positively bewildering. They whirled through Miss Mapp's head like the autumn leaves which she admired so much, and she tried in vain to catch them all, and, when caught, to tick them off on her fingers. Each, moreover, furnished diverse and legitimate conclusions. For instance, taking the thumb, one. If nobody of the slightest importance arrived by the tram, that might be because A. Nothing had happened, and they were all playing golf. B. The worst had happened, and, as the padre had feared, the duelists had first shot him and then each other. C. The next worst had happened, and the padre was arranging for the reverent removal of the corpse of 1. Major Benji, or 2. Captain Puffin, or those of 3. Both. Miss Mapp let go of her thumb and lightly touched her forefinger. Two, the padre might arrive alone. In that case, anything or nothing might have happened to either or both of the others, and the various contingencies hanging on this arrival were so numerous that there was not time to sort them out. Three, the padre might arrive with two limping figures whom he assisted. Here it must not be forgotten that Captain Puffin always limped, and the Major occasionally. Miss Mapp did not forget it. 4. The Padre might arrive with a stretcher. Query. Whose? 5. The Padre might arrive with two stretchers. 6. Three stretchers might arrive from the shining sands at the town where the women were weeping and wringing their hands. In that case, Miss Mapp saw herself busily employed in strengthening poor Evie, who now was running about like a mouse from group to group, picking up crumbs of cosmic consciousness. Miss Mapp had got as far as sixthly, though she was aware she had not exhausted the possibilities, when the tram stopped. She furtively took out from her pocket, she had focused them before she put them in, the opera glasses through which she had watched the station yard on a day which had been very much less exciting than this. After one glance, she put them back again, feeling vexed and disappointed with herself, for the denouement which they had so unerringly disclosed was one that had not entered her mind at all. In that moment, she had seen that out of the tram there stepped three figures, and no stretcher. One figure, that is true, limped, but in a manner so natural that she scorned to draw any deductions from that halting gait. They proceeded, side by side, across the bridge, over the river, towards the town. 
It is no use denying that the cosmic consciousness of the ladies of Tilling was aware of a disagreeable anticlimax to so many hopes and fears. It had, of course, hoped for the best, but it had not expected that the best would be quite as bad as this. The best, to put it frankly, would have been a bandaged arm or something of that kind. There was still room for the more hardened optimist to hope that something of some sort had occurred, or that something of some sort had been averted, and that the whole affair was not, in the delicious new slang phrase of the Padres, which was spreading like wildfire through Tilling, a washout. Pistols might have been innocuously discharged for all that was known to the contrary, but it looked bad. Miss Mapp was the first to recover from the blow and took Diver's podgy hand. Diver, darling, she said, I feel so deeply thankful. What a wonderful and beautiful end to all our anxiety. There was a subconscious regret with regard to the anxiety. The anxiety was, so to speak, a dear and beloved departed. And Diver did not feel so sure that the end was so beautiful and wonderful. Her grandfather, Miss Mapp had reason to know, had been a butcher, and probably some inherited indifference to slaughter lurked in her tainted blood. There's the portmanteau, still, she said hopefully. Pistols in the portmanteau. Your idea, Elizabeth? Yes, dear, said Elizabeth, but thank God I must have been very wrong about the portmanteau. The outside porter told me that he brought it up from the station to Major Benji's house half an hour ago. Fancy your not knowing that. I feel sure he is a truthful man, for he attends the Padre's confirmation class. If there had been pistols in it, Major Benji and Captain Puffin would have gone away, too. I am quite happy about that now. It went away and it has come back. That's all about the portmanteau. She paused a moment. But what does it contain, then? She said quickly, more as if she was thinking aloud than talking to Diver. Why did Major Benji pack it and send it to the station this morning? Where has it come back from? Why did it go there? She felt that she was saying too much and pressed her hand to her head. "'Has all this happened this morning?' she said. "'What a full morning, dear. "'Lovely autumn leaves. "'I shall go home and have my lunch and rest. "'A reservoir diver.' "'Miss Mapp's eternal reservoirs had begun to get on Diver's nerves, "'and as she lingered here a moment more, "'a great idea occurred to her, "'which temporarily banished the disappointment about the duelists. Elizabeth, as all the world knew, had accumulated a great reservoir of provisions in the false bookcase in her garden room, and Diver determined that, if she could think of a neat phrase, the very next time Elizabeth said "Oh, reservoir to her, she would work in an allusion to Elizabeth's own reservoir of corned beef, tongue, flour, bovril, dried apricots, and condensed milk. She would have to frame some stinging rejoinder which would escape her when next Elizabeth used that stale old phrase. It would have to be short, swift and spontaneous, and therefore required careful thought. It would be good to bring pop into it also. Your reservoir in the garden room hasn't gone pop again, I hope, darling, was the first draft that occurred to her, but that was not sufficiently condensed. Pop goes the reservoir on the analogy of the weasel, was better. And better than either. Was there not some sort of corn called pop corn, which Americans ate? Have you any pop corn in your reservoir? That would be a nasty one. But it all required thinking over, and the sight of the padre and the duelists crossing the field below, as she still lingered on this escarpment of the hill, brought the duel back to her mind. It would have been considered inquisitive, even at Tilling, to put direct questions to the combatants, and, still hoping for the best, ask them point-blank who won, or something of that sort. But until she arrived at some sort of information, the excruciating pangs of curiosity that must be endured could be likened only to some acute toothache of the mind, with no dentist to stop or remove the source of the trouble. Elizabeth had already succumbed to these pangs of surmise and excitement, and had frankly gone home to rest, and her absence, the fact that for the next hour or two she could not, except by some extraordinary feat on the telephone, get hold of anything which would throw light on the whole prodigious situation, inflamed Diver's brain to the highest pitch of inventiveness. She knew that she was Elizabeth's inferior in point of reconstructive imagination, 
and to the present moment, while the other was recuperating her energies for fresh assaults on the unknown, was Diva's opportunity. The one person who might be presumed to know more than anybody else was the Padre, but while he was with the duelists, it was as impossible to ask him what had happened as to ask the duelists who had won. She must, while Miss Mapp rested, get hold of the Padre without the duelists. Even as Athena sprang full-grown and panoplied from the brain of Zeus, so from Diva's brain there sprang her plan complete. She even resisted the temptation to go on admiring autumn tints in order to see how the interesting trio looked, when, as they must presently do, they passed close to where she stood and hurried home, pausing only to purchase, pay for, and carry away with her from the provision shop a large and expensively dressed crab, a dainty of which the padre was inordinately fond. Ruinous as this was, there was a note of triumph in her voice when, on arrival, she loudly called for Janet and told her to lay another place at the luncheon table. Then, putting a strong constraint on herself, she waited three minutes by her watch in order to give the padre time to get home, and then rang him up and reminded him that he had promised to lunch with her that day. It was no use asking him to lunch in such a way as he might refuse. She employed without remorse this pitiless force majeure. The engagement was short and brisk. He pleaded that not even now could he remember even having been asked, which was not surprising, and said that he and wee wifey had begun lunch, on which Diva unmasked her last gun and told him that she had ordered a crab on purpose. That silenced further argument, and he said that he and wee wifey would be round in a jiffy and rang off. She did not particularly want wee wifey, but there was enough crab. Diva felt that she had never laid out four shillings to better purpose when, a quarter of an hour later, the padre gave her the full account of his fruitless search among the sand dunes. So deeply impressive was his sense of being buoyed up to that incredibly fatiguing and perilous excursion by some power outside himself. It never even occurred to her to think that it was an elaborate practical joke on the part of the power outside himself to spur him on to such immense exertions to no purpose at all. He had only got as far as this over his interrupted lunch with wee wifey, and though she too was in agonised suspense as to what happened next, she bore the repetition with great equanimity, only making small mouse-like noises of impatience which nobody heard. He was quite forgetting to speak either Scotch or Elizabethan English, so obvious was the absorption of his hearers, without these added aids to command attention. And then I came round the corner of the clubhouse, he said, and there were Captain Puffin and the Major finishing their match on the eighteenth hole. Then there's been no duel at all, said Diver, scraping the shell of the crab. I feel sure of it. There wouldn't have been time for a duel and a round of golf, in addition to the impossibility of playing golf immediately after a duel. No nerves could stand it. Besides, I ask one of their caddies. They had come straight from the tram to the clubhouse, and from the clubhouse to the first tee. They had not been alone for a moment. Wash out, said Diver, wondering whether this had been worth four shillings. So tame was the conclusion. Mrs. Bartlett gave a little squeak, which was her preliminary to speech. "'But I, I do not see why there may not be a duel yet, Kenneth,' she said. "'Because they did not fight this morning. "'Excellent crab, dear Diver. "'So good of you to ask us. "'There's no reason why there shouldn't be a duel this afternoon. "'Oh, dear me, and cold beef as well. "'I should be quite stuffed. "'Depend upon it, a man doesn't take the trouble to write a challenge and all that "'unless he means business.' "'The Padre held up his hand. "'He felt that he was gradually growing to be the hero of the whole affair.' He had certainly looked over the edge of numberless hollows in the sand dunes, with vivid anticipations of having a bullet whiz by him on each separate occasion. It behoved him to take a sublime line. My dear, he said, business is hardly a word to apply to murder. That within the last twenty-four hours there was the intention of fighting a duel I don't deny, but something has decidedly happened which has averted that deplorable calamity. Peace and reconciliation is the result of it, and I have never seen two men so unaffectedly friendly. Diva got up and whirled round the table to get the port for the padre, so pleased was she at a fresh idea coming to her while still dear Elizabeth was resting. She attributed it to the crab. We've all been on a false scent, she said. 
peace and reconciliation happened before they went out to the sand dunes at all. It happened at the station. They met at the station, you know. It is proved that Major Flint went there. Major wouldn't send a portmanteau off alone. And it's proved that Captain Puffin went there, too, because the note which his housemate found on the table before she saw the challenge from the Major, which was on the chimney-piece, said that he had been called away very suddenly. No, they both went to catch the early train in order to go away before they could be stopped and kill each other. But why didn't they go? What happened? Don't suppose the outside porter showed them how wicked they were, confirmation class or no confirmation class. Stumps me. Almost wish Elizabeth was here. She's good at guessing. The Padre's eye brightened. Reaction after the perils of the morning, crab and port combined to make a man of him. Eh, tis a bonny wee drappy of port whatever, Mistress Plasso, he said, and I dinna ken that ye're far wrong in jalousin that Mistress Map might have a wee bitty word to say about her, gin she had the mind. She was wrong about the portmanteau, said Diver, confessed she was wrong. Hoops, I'm not minding the bit poch manty, said the Padre. What else does she know? asked Diver feverishly. There was no doubt that the Padre had the fullest attention of the two ladies again, and there was no need to talk Scotch any more. Begin at the beginning, he said. What did we suppose was the cause of the quarrel? Anything, said Diver. Golf, tiger skins, coal strike, summertime. He shook his head. I grant you words may pass on such subjects, he said. We feel keenly, I know, about summertime in Tilling, though we shall all be reconciled over that next Sunday, when real time... God's time, as I am venturing to call it in my sermon, comes in again. Diva had to bite her tongue to prevent herself bolting off on this new scent. After all, she had invested in crab to learn about duelling, not about summer time. Well, she said. We may have had words on that subject, said the padre, booming as if he was in the pulpit already, but we should, I hope, none of us go so far as to catch the earliest train with pistols in defence of our conviction about summer time. No, Mrs. Plasto, if you are right, and there is something to be said for your view, in thinking that they both went to such lengths as to be in time for the early train, in order to fight a duel undisturbed, you must look for a more solid cause than that. Diva vainly racked her brains to think of anything more worthy of the highest pitches of emotion than this. If it had been she and Miss Mapp who had been embroiled, hoarding and dress would have occurred to her. But as it was... No one in his senses could dream that the captain and the major were sartorial rivals, unless they had quarrelled over the question as to which of them wore the snuffiest old clothes. Give it up, she said. What did they quarrel about? Passion, said the padre, in those full deep tones in which next Sunday he would allude to God's time. I do not mean anger, but the flame that exalts man to heaven, or... Or does exactly the opposite. But whomever for? asked Diva, quite thrown off her bearings. Such a thing had never occurred to her, for, as far as she was aware, passion, except in the sense of temper, did not exist in Tilling. Tilling was far too respectable. The Padre considered this a moment. I am betraying no confidence, he said, because no one has confided in me. But there certainly is a lady in this town... I do not allude to Miss Irene, who has long enjoyed the Major's particular esteem. May not some deprecating remark? We wifey gave a much louder squeal than usual. He means poor Elizabeth, she said in a high, tremulous voice. Fancy, Kenneth! Diver, a few seconds before, had seen no reason why the Padre should drink the rest of her port, and was now in the act of drinking some of that unusual beverage herself. She tried to swallow it, but it was too late, and the next moment all the openings of her face were fountains of that delicious wine. She choked and she gurgled until the last drop had left her windpipe, under the persuasion of pattings on the back from the others, and then she gave up to loud, hoarse laughter, through which there shrilled the staccato squeaks of wee wifey. Nothing, even if you are being laughed at yourself, is so infectious as prolonged laughter, and the padre felt himself forced to join it. When one of them got a little better, a relapse ensued by reason of infection from the others, and it was not till exhaustion set in that this triple volcano became quiescent again. 
Only fancy, said Evie faintly. How did such an idea get into your head, Kenneth? His voice shook as he answered. Well, <laughs> we were all a little worked up this morning, he said. The idea... Really, I don't know what we have all been laughing at. I do, said Diver. Go on about the idea. A feminine, a diabolical inspiration flared within wee wifey's mind. Elizabeth suggested it herself, she squealed. Naturally, Diver could not help remembering that she had found Miss Mapp and the Padre in earnest conversation together when she forced her way in that morning with the news that the duelists had left by the 11.20 tram. Nobody could be expected to have so short a memory as to have forgotten that. Just now, she forgave Elizabeth for anything she had ever done. That might have to be reconsidered afterwards, but at present it was valid enough. Did she suggest it? she asked. The Padre behaved like a man, and lied like Ananias. Most emphatically she did not, he said. The disappointment would have been severe had the two ladies believed this confident assertion, and Diver pictured a delightful interview with Elizabeth, in which she would suddenly tell her the wild surmise the Padre had made with regard to the cause of the duel, and see how she looked then. Just see how she looked then, that was all. Self-consciousness and guilt would fly their colours. Miss Mapp had been tempted, when she went home that morning, after enjoying the autumn tints, to ask Diver to lunch with her, but remembered in time that she had told her cook to broach one of the tins of corned beef, which no human wizard could coax into the store cupboard again if he shut the door after it. Diver would have been sure to say something acid and elusive, to remark on its excellence being happily not wasted on the poor people in the hospital, or, if she had not said anything at all about it, her silence as she ate a great deal would have had a sharp flavour. But Miss Mapp would have liked, especially when she went to take her rest afterwards on the big sofa in the garden room, to have had somebody to talk to, for her brain seethed with conjectures as to what had happened, what was happening, and would happen, and discussion was the best method of simplifying a problem, of narrowing it down to the limits of probability, whereas when she was alone now with her own imaginings, the most fantastic of them seemed plausible. She had, however, handed a glorious suggestion to the Padre, the one, that is, which concerned the cause of the duel, and it had been highly satisfactory to observe the sympathy and respect with which he had imbibed it. She had, too, been so discreet about it. She had not come within measurable distance of asserting that the challenge had been in any way connected with her. She had only been very emphatic on the point of its not being connected with poor dear Irene, and then occupied herself with her sweet flowers. That had been sufficient, and she felt in her bones and marrow that he inferred what she had meant him to infer. The vulture of surmise ceased to peck at her for a few moments as she considered this, and followed up a thread of gold. Though the padre would surely be discreet, she hoped that he would let slip to dear Evie in the course of the vivid conversation they would be sure to have over lunch, that he had a good guess as to the cause which had led to that savage challenge, upon which dear Evie would be certain to ply him with direct squeaks and questions, and when she got hot, as in animal, vegetable and mineral, his reticence would lead her to make a good guess too. She might be incredulous, but there the idea would be in her mind, while, if she felt that these stirring days were no time for scepticism, she could hardly fail to be interested and touched. Before long, how soon Miss Mapp was happily not aware, she would pop in to see Diver, or Diver would pop in to see her, and Evie, observing a discretion similar to that of the Padre and herself, would soon enable dear Diver to make a good guess too. After that, all would be well, for dear Diver, such a gossiping darling, would undoubtedly tell everybody in Tilling, under vows of secrecy, so that she could have the pleasure of telling everybody herself just what her good guess was. Thus, very presently, all Tilling would know exactly that which Miss Mapp had not said to the dear Padre, namely that the duel which had been fought, or which hadn't been fought, was all about her. And the best of it was that though everybody knew, it would still be a great and beautiful secret, reposing inviolably in every breast or chest, as the case might be. 
She had no anxiety about anybody asking direct questions of the duelists, for if duelling, for years past, had been a subject which no delicately minded person alluded to purposely in Major Benji's presence, how much more now, after this critical morning, would that subject be taboo? That certainly was a good thing, for the duelists, if closely questioned, might have a different explanation, and it would be highly inconvenient to have two contradictory stories going about. But, as it was, nothing could be nicer. The whole of the rest of Tilling, under promise of secrecy, would know. And even if under further promises of secrecy they communicated their secret to each other, there would be no harm done. After this excursion into Elysian fields, poor Miss Mapp had to get back to her vulture again, and the hour's rest that she had felt was due to herself as the heroine of a duel became a period of extraordinary cerebral activity. Puzzle as she might, she could make nothing whatever of the portmanteau and the excursion to the early train, and she got up long before her hour was over, since she found that the more she thought, the more invincible were the objections to any conclusion that she drowningly grasped at. Whatever attack she made on this mystery, the garrison failed to march out and surrender, but kept their flag flying, and her conjectures were woefully blasted by the forces of the most elementary reasons. But, as the agony of suspense, if no fresh topic of interest intervened, would be frankly unendurable, she determined to concentrate no more on it, but rather to commit it to the ice-house, or safe, of her subconscious mind, from which, at will, when she felt refreshed and reinvigorated, she could unlock it and examine it again. The whole problem was more superlatively baffling than any that she could remember having encountered in all these inquisitive years, just as the subject of it was more majestic than any, for it concerned not hoarding, nor visits of the Prince of Wales, nor poppy-trimmed gowns, but life and death and firing of deadly pistols. And should love be added to this august list? Certainly not by her, though Tilling might do what it liked. In fact, Tilling always did. She walked across to the bow window from which she had conducted so many exciting and successful investigations. But today the view seemed as stale and unprofitable as the world appeared to Hamlet, even though Mrs. Poppet at that moment went waddling down the street and disappeared round the corner where the dentist and Mr. Wise lived. With a sense of fatigue, Miss Mapp recalled the fact that she had seen the housemaid cleaning Mrs. Wise's windows yesterday. Children, dear, was it yesterday? and had noted her industry, and drawn from it the irresistible conclusion that Mr. Wise was probably expected home. He usually came back about mid-October, and let slip allusions to his enjoyable visits in Scotland, and his villeggiatura, so he was pleased to express it, with his sister the Contessa di Faraglione at Capri. That Contessa Faraglione was a rather mythical personage to Miss Mapp's mind, she was certainly not in a medieval copy of Who's Who, which was the only accessible handbook in matters relating to noble and notable personages, and though Miss Mapp would not have taken an oath that she did not exist, she saw no strong reason for supposing that she did. Certainly she had never been to Tilling, which was strange as her brother lived there, and there was nothing but her brother's illusions to certify her. About Mrs. Poppet now. Had she gone to see Mr. Wise, or had she gone to the dentist? One or other it must be, for, apart from them, that particular street contained nobody who counted, and at the bottom it simply conducted you out into the uneventful country. Mrs. Poppet was all dressed up, and she would never walk in the country in such a costume. It would do either for Mr. Wise or the dentist, for she was the sort of woman who would like to appear grand in the dentist's chair, so that he might be shy of hurting such a fine lady. Then again, Mrs. Poppet had wonderful teeth, almost too good to be true, and before now she had asked who lived at that pretty little house just round the corner, as if to show that she didn't know where the dentist lived. Or had she found out by some underhand means that Mr. Wise had come back, and had gone to call on him, and give him the first news of the duel, and talk to him about Scotland? Very likely they had neither of them been to Scotland at all. They conspired to say that they had been to Scotland, and stayed at shooting lodges, keepers' lodges more likely, in order to impress Tilling with their magnificence. 
Miss Mapp sat down on the central heating pipes in her window and fell into one of her reconstructive musings. Partly, if Mr. Wise was back, it was well just to run over his record. Partly she wanted to divert her mind from the two houses just below, that of Major Benji on the one side and that of Captain Puffin on the other, which contained the key to the great insoluble mystery, from conjecture as to which she wanted to obtain relief. Mr. Wise, anyhow, would serve as a mild opiate, for she had never lost an angry interest in him. Though he was for eight months of the year or thereabouts in Tilling, he was never, for a single hour, of Tilling. He did not exactly invest himself with an air of condescension and superiority. Miss Mapp did him that justice. But he made other people invest him with it, so that it came to the same thing. He was invested. He did not drag the fact of his sister being the Contessa Farleone into conversation, but if talk turned on sisters, and he was asked about this, he confessed to her nobility. The same phenomenon appeared when the innocent county of Hampshire was mentioned, for it turned out that he knew the county well, being one of the wisers of Whitchurch. You couldn't say he talked about it, but he made other people talk about it. He was quite impervious to satire on such points, for, when, goaded to madness, Miss Mapp had once said that she was one of the maps of Maidstone, he had merely bowed and said, A very old family, I believe. And when the conversation branched off to old families, he had rather pointedly said we to Miss Mapp. So poor Miss Mapp was sorry she had been satirical. But for some reason, Tilling never ceased to play up to Mr. Wise, and there was not a tea party or a bridge party given during the whole period of his residence there to which he was not invited. Hostesses always started with him, sending him round a note with to await answer written in the top left-hand corner, since he had clearly stated that he considered the telephone an undignified instrument only fit to be used for household purposes, and had installed his in the kitchen in the manner of the Wisers of Whitchurch. That alone, apart from Mr. Wise's old-fashioned notions on the subject, made telephoning impossible, for your summons was usually answered by his cook, who instantly began scolding the butcher, irrespective and disrespectful of whom you were. When her mistake was made known to her, she never apologised, but grudgingly said she would call Mr. Figgis, who was Mr. Wise's valet. Mr. Figgis always took a long time in coming, and when he came, he sneezed, or did something disagreeable, and said, Yes, yes, what is it? in a very testy manner. After explanations, he would consent to tell his master, which took another long time, and even then, Mr. Wise did not come himself, and usually refused the preferred invitation. Miss Mapp had tried the expedient of sending Withers to the telephone when she wanted to get at Mr. Wise, but this had not succeeded, for Withers and Mr. Wise's cook quarrelled so violently before they got to business that Mr. Figgis had to calm the cook and Withers to complain to Miss Mapp. This, in brief, was the general reason why Tilling sent notes to Mr. Wise. As for chatting through the telephone, which was the main use of telephones, the thing was quite out of the question. Miss Mapp revived a little as she made this piercing analysis of Mr. Wise, and the warmth of the central heating pipes on this baffling day of autumn tints was comforting. No one could say that Mr. Wise was not punctilious in matters of social etiquette, for though he refused three-quarters of the invitations which were showered upon him, he invariably returned the compliment by an autograph note, hoping that he might have the pleasure of entertaining you at lunch on Thursday next for he always gave a small luncheon party on Thursday. These invitations were couched in Chesterfield terms. Mr. Wise said that he had met a mutual friend just now who had informed him that you were in residence and had encouraged him to hope that you might give him the pleasure of your company, etc. This was alluring diction. It presented the image of Mr. Wise stepping briskly home again, quite heartened up by this chance encounter, and no longer the prey to melancholy at the thought that you might not give him the joy. He was encouraged to hope. These polite expressions were traced in a neat upright hand on paper which, when he had just come back from Italy, often bore a coronet on the top with Villa Farilione, Capri, printed on the right-hand top corner, and Amelia, the name of his putative sister, in sprawling gilt on the left, the whole thing being lightly erased. 
Of course, he was quite right to filch a few sheets, but it threw rather a lurid light on his character that they should be such grand ones. Last year only, in a fit of passion at Mr. Wise having refused six invitations running on the plea of other engagements, Miss Mapp had headed a movement, the object of which was that Tilling should not accept any of Mr. Wise's invitations unless he accepted its. This had met with theoretical sympathy. The Bartlett's, Diver, Irene, the Poppets had all agreed, rather absently, that it would be a very proper thing to do. But the very next Thursday they had all including the originator, met on Mr. Wise's doorstep for a luncheon party, and the movement then and there collapsed. Though they all protested and rebelled against such a notion, the horrid fact remained that everybody basked in Mr. Wise's effulgence whenever it was disposed to shed itself on them. Much as they distrusted the information they dragged out of him, they adored hearing about the Villa Faraglione, and dressed themselves in their very best clothes to do so. Then again, there was the quality of the lunch itself. Often there was caviar, and it was impossible, though the interrogator who asked whether it came from Twemlow's feared the worst, not to be mildly excited to know, when Mr. Wise referred the question to Figgis, that the caviar had arrived from Odessa that morning. The haunch of roe deer came from Perthshire, the wine, on the subject of which the Major could not be silent, and which often made him extremely talkative, was from my brother-in-law's vineyard and Mr. Wise would taste it with the air of a connoisseur, and say, Not quite as good as last year. I must tell the con- I mean, my sister. Again, when Mr. Wise did condescend to honour a tea party or a bridge party, Tilling writhed under the consciousness that their general deportment was quite different from that which they ordinarily practised among themselves. There was never any squabbling at Mr. Wise's table, and such squabbling as took place at the other tables was conducted in low hissings and whispers, so that Mr. Wise should not hear. Diver never haggled over her gains or losses when he was there. The Padre never talked Scotch or Elizabethan English. Evie never squeaked like a mouse. No shrill recriminations or stately sarcasms took place between partners, and if there happened to be a little disagreement about the rules, Mr. Wise's decision, though he was not a better player than any of them, was accepted without a murmur. At intervals for refreshment, in the same way, Diver no longer filled her mouth and both hands with nougat chocolate. There was no scrambling or jostling, but the ladies were waited on by the gentlemen who then refreshed themselves. And yet Mr. Wise in no way asserted himself, or reduced them all to politeness by talking about the polished manners of Italians. It was Tilling itself which chose to behave in this unusual manner in his presence. Sometimes Diva might forget herself for a moment, and address something withering to her partner, but the partner never replied in suitable terms, and Diva became honey-mouthed again. It was, indeed, if Mr. Wise had appeared at two or three parties, rather a relief not to find him at the next, and breathe freely in less rarefied air. But whether he came or not, he always returned the invitation by one to a Thursday luncheon party, and thus the high circles of Tilling met every week at his house. Miss Mapp came to the end of this brief retrospect, and determined, when once it was proved that Mr. Wise had arrived, to ask him to tea on Tuesday. That would mean lunch with him on Thursday, and it was unnecessary to ask anybody else unless Mr. Wise accepted. If he refused, there would be no tea party. But, after the events of these last twenty-four hours, there was no vividness in these plans and reminiscences, and her eye turned to the profile of the Colonel's house. The portmanteau, she said to herself. No, she must take her mind off that subject. She would go for a walk not into the high street, but into the quiet level country, away from the turmoil of passion, in the padre sense, and quarrels, in her own, where she could cool her curiosity and her soul with the contemplation of the swallows and the white butterflies, if they had not all been killed by the touch of frost last night, and the autumn tints, of which there were none whatever in the treeless marsh. Decidedly, the shortest way out of the town was that which led past Mr. Wise's house. But before leaving the garden room, she practised several faces at the looking-glass opposite the door, which should suitably express, if she met anybody to whom the cause of the challenge was likely to have spread, the bewildering emotion which the unwilling cause of it must feel. There must be a wistful wonder, 
there must be a certain pride, there must be the remains of romantic excitement, and there must be deep womanly anxiety. The carriage of the head did the pride, the wide-open eyes did the wistful wonder and the romance, the deep womanly anxiety lurked in the tremulous smile, and a violent rubbing of the cheeks produced the colour of excitement. In answer to any impertinent questions, if she encountered such, she meant to give an absent answer, as if she had not understood. Thus equipped, she set forth. It was rather disappointing to meet nobody, but as she passed Mr. Wise's bow window, she adjusted the chrysanthemums she wore, and she had a good sight of his profile and the back of Mrs. Poppet's head. They appeared deep in conversation, and Miss Mapp felt that the tiresome woman was probably giving him a very incomplete account of what had happened. She returned late for tea, and broke off her apologies to Withers for being such a trouble, because she saw a note on the hall table. There was a coronet on the back of the envelope, and it was addressed in the neat, punctilious hand which so well expressed its writer. Villa Faraglione, Capri, a coronet, and Amelia, all lightly crossed out, headed the page, and she read, Dear Miss Mapp, it is such a pleasure to find myself in our little tilling again, and our mutual friend Mrs. Poppet, M.B.E., tells me you are in residence, and encourages me to hope that I may induce you to take déjeuner with me on Thursday at one o'clock. May I assure you, with all delicacy, that you will not meet here anyone whose presence could cause you the slightest embarrassment. Pray excuse this hasty note. Figgis will wait for your answer if you are in. Yours very sincerely, Algernon Wise. Had not Withers been present, who might have misconstrued her action, Miss Mapp would have kissed the note. Failing that, she forgave Mrs. Poppet for being an M.B.E. "'The dear woman,' she said, "'she has heard and has told him.' Of course, she need not ask Mr. Wise to tea now. 